Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. I'm Elliot Jaffe from US Bank, and I'm pleased to be here and uh, have a terrific day, and we are thrilled to be sponsors of DealBook again. Uh, this morning, we're going to hear from Emma Sapala and Faith Saley. Uh, Emma is from Yale University, and uh, we've been chatting for a few minutes. Uh, she's going to help us think about how, as leaders, we can remain more positive and adapt to what is an especially challenging environment. environment. And Faith uh, leads the US Bank Real Good podcast. So um, good morning, and uh, turn it over to you. And thank you to US Bank for making this experience possible. Um, welcome to all of you to this breakfast. Congratulations on not being intermittent fasters. I think that puts you ahead of the game already. Um, we are going to chat about the science of leadership and how it might help you as leaders navigate this new world we're living in. And also, I want to give a shout out to anyone who surrendered your cell phone when you were given the opportunity at the door. Can, can anybody who did that raise your hands? <laughs> oh, I was going to take a selfie with... <laughs> okay, so, um, so that's okay. So for those of us who are not so evolved, um, if we could have our cell phones on silent, that would be great. Um, Dr. Emma Seppala is the embodiment of calm and self-possession, but if your phone goes off, you, you don't want to see her go all Patty Lapone on you. Um, so we will hear from Dr. Seppala, um, and then we'll have a chance to experience some of the science that we're talking about today. And then time and, and God willing, we will open up the floor for questions at the end. So during the pandemic, earlier in the pandemic, um, some of the most read articles by the New York Times were about managing our feelings of languishing. For a little while, I feel like that was le mot juste that everyone was using. And because the Times never leaves us hanging, they also followed up with articles about enabling feelings of flourishing. And this got us thinking about languishing and flourishing in the workplace, where so many of us spend a large part of our lives. And although it can feel like the pandemic is in the rearview mirror, we're all seeing each other's faces today and people are returning to the workplaces, um, many of us do remain in this liminal place between languishing and flourishing. And on societal and personal levels, the people with whom you work are experiencing, you know, struggles, economic hardships, existential crises. So we're here today to, to ask, can we harness what the science of leadership teaches us so that people like you with power and purpose, people like you who care, can enable your teams and your colleagues to get the best out of themselves, both personally and professionally. And more fundamentally, how can this research that Emma Seppala has been working on help you thrive and flourish yourselves as leaders? And you are the perfect person to discuss these questions with. Um, Emma Seppala, writer, author, uh, you have written some of my favorite Harvard Business Review articles. Um, so if we could start today, um, first of all, I want to congratulate you because out of the thousands of people I've ever interviewed, you're the only person with two umlauts <laughs> in your name, which is remarkable. Um, you have said that, hold on, I don't want to misquote you. Here it is. I even quoted you to my children this morning. The quality of our life depends on the state of our mind, not the other way around, right? Can we, in the context in, in which we've come together this morning, can we extrapolate that and say that the quality of our work life depends on the collective state of our minds and the minds of our colleagues? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you know, we can often think, okay, our environment, my environment, my circumstances, what's happening to me, what's happening to the world is sort of responsible for my state of mind, um, my anxiety or whatever uh, we're going through. but. Even during the pandemic, I think there, there were days when, you know, things were hard, but you were feeling okay. Or, on the other hand, things could be going fine. It's not the pandemic's over, but you're having a miserable day. So, right? so it, it's really the state of our mind, the, our emotional well-being, our emotional balance that impacts whether or not our life feels good at that moment, whether we feel resilient at that moment. And certainly what we're seeing in uh, research on leadership right now is that the type of leadership that has the most uh, impact, that leads to the greatest engagement, 
greatest loyalty, the best sort of customer service, the, the better bottom line is the type of leadership that promotes a state of psychological well-being in employees. Um, th and the result is, um, is so good for organizations that this is the leadership of the future. There's no doubt in my mind about it because it leads to better results. So how effective, y you, <coughs> wrote, you wrote an article called The Best Leaders Have a Contagious Positive Energy. And I wonder what happens when we kind of invert that. <clears throat> and by that I mean, how effective is it for a leader to be honest about his or her own mental health challenges? Yeah. Like even something as transparent as, as expressing that they're not having a great day. Is transparent vulnerability from a leader inspiring? Yeah, so let me back up a little and just explain what I meant by that. For those who haven't read the article, um, some colleagues of mine were, were looking into organizations as these sort of large networks, and they noticed that, oh my goodness, it, it within these organizations, there's these pockets that are super productive. What is going on here? Why, are, why is this group of people doing so well and that group of people doing so well? And what they found was at the core of each of those networks was one person who was, and, he, and I remember my colleague saying, Emma, it's embarrassing to use this word as a scientist, but the only thing I can use to describe this person is that they have positive energy. What does that mean? That they, I think we've all experienced this, being around certain people, when you leave their presence, you feel deflated or kind of less energized or maybe down even. And then there's other people that when you encounter them, like Faith, for example, <laughs> that after leaving their presence, you feel uplifted and energized and enlivened. Have you all experienced this? Yeah. yeah, and so um, that's one of the characteristics of these positive leaders is that they are life-giving, life-supportive, and as humans, we are drawn toward that which is life-supportive, and the result is so much more um, product, so much greater productivity and innovation and, and creativity and so forth. I think we've probably all experienced this. Now, um, what what is a positive leader? Certainly, authenticity is part of it. You can't fake things because we see through people faking things, don't we? Yeah, it's so obvious. And so of course authenticity is part of it. And when a leader is does show human moments, that gives permission to others to feel that they too are allowed to be human. And I think at the core of the positive leadership research is, um, is exactly that, the humanness. Looking at the person behind the employee or the colleague, making room for um, those human moments of caring and compassion for the person before you know, before you think only about them as sort of a productive unit, um, if that makes sense. I could go more deeply into into positive leadership. If that yeah, I mean, when you did this this research again, what what I think strikes a lot of people is that this is science. You are scientists researching yeah, positive energy, which m made some of your scientific colleagues feel uncomfortable <laughs> using yeah. those woo-woo words, right? right? But it's real yeah. and it's empirical. Mm -hmm. And when you did this research, you said you were astonished by the results. So yeah. what astonished you about what you learned about positive energizers? Well, it's interesting. Let's think about it this way. How do um, organizations usually try to get loyalty? Well, how, would, how, well, how do they try to get loyalty from their employees? It's usually through money, right? Yeah. Perks, <laughs> benefits in some manner. Um, but now I want everyone to do this exercise. Like think back on a person in your life that was there for you as a mentor, maybe in childhood, maybe in young adulthood, maybe in your adulthood, who was there for you at no, uh, th at no, for no benefit of themselves. They saw you for who you were and they were like, I've got your back. You can do this. Maybe they helped you maybe in some way or some, some manner. Does everyone, can everyone think of one person like that in the room? Yes? Okay, now if that person texted you right now, assuming you have your phone with you, and said, I urgently need help, would you drop everything, even the deal book summit, <laughs> to go and call them? Yes. Isn't that loyalty? Yeah. That is loyalty. It is that, that very deep human connection you have with another person who had your back, who cared for you as a human. That's loyalty. And it's, so yes, it's science and also it's not brain science. It's very obvious, but we've somehow forgotten it, um, you know, with these sort of traditional models of leadership. But this is the leadership that we need now. It's the leadership we've always needed. It's the leadership that research shows leads to the best uh, financial results, shareholder returns, et cetera. The list goes on. Um, and there's, uh, there's so much data to back this up. In fact, if you're interested in these articles, you can easily find them, and they link back to the sources. Um, 
but yeah, so that, that's really uh, one of the things that it comes down to. What's remarkable about your research, and you mentioned this before, is that energizing an entire company can start with one person. Right. So when people feel perhaps impotent in the in the what seem like unwieldy structures of a company, yeah. they're they're really not. Like every single person in this room can energize his or her colleagues. So mm -hmm. what would be what would be some bullet points, some action items to take away? Yeah. No, I love what you're saying because there is a ripple effect, and this is some of my favorite studies showing that. Um, uh, so let me let me back up a little bit. Uh, we've all experienced this, where we've seen someone helping someone else. How do you feel when you you know you're walking down the streets of Manhattan and you see someone helping an elderly person or or someone who needs help? How, how does I it feel like you calling feel? the New York Post and <laughs> saying this is a great city? <laughs> yeah, no, you yeah. feel great just to witness it. Just to witness it. And what research shows is that it creates this state within where we're moved. Um, in some manner, it's called the state of elevation, right? And what research shows is that when you experience that state of elevation, it you're more likely to go and help someone. And actually, when one person is more compassionate, it impacts three degrees of separation away from them. So if you're kind to, you know, somebody that then uh, whoever witnesses you, you know, their their brother's spouse's, you know, teacher, is impacted. There's greater chance of of um, there being more compassion. Now, how this ties into leadership is that leaders who also generate feelings of elevation in people who work for them because they're kind, because they, um, they prioritize that, that those human moments, the, the compassion and so forth, the, the values. So what it comes down to for positive leaders is that they lead with values like kindness and humility and compassion. But that doesn't mean that they don't have expectations and, and big dreams and goals for their employees. But they... Um, their employees know that they have their back. And I'll give you one more example, if that's okay. So um, there's a, a CEO of a large uh, company in Silicon Valley who his priority was um, to lead with compassion. So one of, um, one of his employees was a friend of mine. She was diagnosed with, with um, a really severe brain tumor. And within 15 minutes of her um, sharing this with her colleagues, the CEO called her and he said, what can I do for you? I'm here for you, anything you need, let me know. And so he had it as a policy, even in his very busy day, that within 15 minutes of any employee going through such a difficult moment in their life, that he was going to be there on the phone with them. So that's just an example, very practical. So on a, on a very practical level, leaders can give, to, to demonstrate kindness, it's checking in with colleagues and people on your team in, in an authentic way, like you really care, pausing to hear their answers, giving words of approbation? Yes, and again, yeah, absolutely. So some people have, you know, some leaders I've worked with have said, oh, but I don't have time for all that. But the <laughs> truth is it doesn't take a lot of time. And it makes an interaction much more enjoyable. Um, you know, we have this exercise where we have people sit together for seven minutes and tell their life story. That sounds, it sounds crazy when you and you describe it that way, but it's actually a very moving experience. And you hear in seven minutes about people's know, childhood difficulties, maybe divorces, perhaps, a, you know, all, all the, the twists and turns of a human life. Um, and the connection is so deep after that. And there was one, one leader who came up to me after and he said, you know what, I've been working with this guy for 15 years mm -hmm. and I never knew that he had a child that was, you know, sick at home and all this stuff. And he was crying, you know. And so it just, it, it doesn't take a lot to make, take a few moments and get to know the people that are working for you, what their challenges. And, uh, and of course, it starts with authenticity. It has to be authentic. You have to actually care. But there's something, if you, uh, you know, having looked at the signs of happiness for um, t two decades now, I can summarize it like this, is that the happiest people who are also healthiest and live the longest lives are the people who um, in some way exercise compassion in their lives, balanced with self-compassion. It's not, not at an expense of themselves, but compassion. And we know that when we've asked hundreds of people, like, when are the moments that you're happiest? Usually it's those times when they've helped another person. And I think we've all experienced this. I'll give it another really concrete example where we've had maybe a difficult day. Oh, it was a, it's a difficult day. Like, I don't know, I didn't sleep well, I didn't have breakfast, I got a nasty email or something, right? Feels like a challenging day. And then a friend calls and says, I'm on the side of the highway, I really need help. Or I'm in the, I'm in the emergency room and I really need help. What happens to your energy when you just sort of stand up and go help them? How do you feel? Amazing, right? Yeah. There is nothing really quite as uplifting as being there for another human being. 
So you're talking about our energy and what happens in our bodies. And mm -hmm. something that is always accessible that I've learned through reading your articles is, is breathing. Right. That positive leadership, positive energizing can start with breathing. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I mean, what happens on a cellular level um, and then yeah. lead us in a breathing exercise? Absolutely. So I'll start with a quick story, but first, I mean, I there's something very ironic. I think in the last couple of years, especially, it's been really prominent, this idea of like, well, how do we handle our emotions? What's really ironic to me is no matter how educated someone is, no matter how many MDs or PhDs or any kind of Ds you got after your name, the one thing pro nobody's probably ever learned is how to handle their emotions. You know, we've never learned it. What do we learn to do with our emotions, most of us? Suppress them, right? Yeah. Except maybe if we're Italian, Southern Italians <laughs> apparently do it differently. But, you know, so uh, how's that working out for you, by the way, suppression? How's it working out? I see shaking heads. Okay, it doesn't work out, but we've never really learned how to handle our emotions. And research shows that suppression actually makes our emotions stronger. So if you suppress anger, you actually get more angry, which, of course, that's why you later blow up or it comes out in passive aggression or other ways. So um, this, is, uh, this was a field of research that I was in um, in this field of emotion regulation, and I'm gonna share a story with you before I go on about the breathing. So about <coughs> maybe uh, 15 years ago now, or 10 years ago, my husband walked in the room and he was pale, and I said, what, what's going on? And he said Jake was in an IED. So Jake was a Marine Corps officer in charge of um, the last Humvee on a convoy going across Afghanistan, and he drove over a roadside bomb, drove over a roadside bomb. And in that moment, I don't think we can even imagine what that feels like, uh, just the explosion, the, 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 tra the trauma of, of it all. And when the dust settled and he opened his eyes, he saw his legs were almost completely severed below the knee. Now in that moment, most of us would just fall unconscious, right? And he, in that moment, remembered a breathing exercise that he had learned about in a book, about what to do in a time of wartime crisis like this. And he started to engage in that breathing exercise. And because he did that, he was able to regain his cognitive faculties and do his first act of duty, which was to check on the other service members in the vehicle. And it gave him the presence of mind to do his second act of duty, which was to give orders to call for help. And finally, it gave him the presence of mind to even tourniquet his own legs and to think of propping them upward. And then he fell unconscious. And later he was urgently transported to Germany and then Walter Reed, and he was told if he had not done those things, he would have died that day. Now Jake has lost both of his legs, but he's alive and well, he's got a family, he's working, he's in the US. So why do I tell this story? Because, you know, there's, uh, hopefully none of us will ever experience a stressor that, uh, that intense, and yet our life does encounter moments of stress. And what our research has shown is that the fastest, most efficient way for us to handle the state of our mind, which really governs, again, the quality of our life, is through breathing. And it's something most of us have never learned. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and it's very powerful. So just very simply, when you breathe in, your heart rate and blood pressure increase. And when you breathe out, they slow down. Actually, if you're in a doctor's office, you can like get the nurse kind of worried. If you, you know, exhale for a really long time, they'll be like, what's going on? <laughs> Your blood pressure is going to go down, um, and you know th what we've some research studies we've conducted both with veterans and also with um, other stress populations like Yale undergraduates, <laughs> um, and and also with veterans with PTSD. Several studies showing that breathing was more effective than any other intervention that we gave for mental health, well-being, resilience. Yeah, you led a, a research team that had people like they were either meditating or working on this breathing, or doing an emotional intelligence training. Yeah. Yeah, and breathing crushed it. <laughs> crushed it. <laughs> yeah, it's one way to put it. So we uh, that wasn't just one exercise. Though, like with Jake, he did a really simple exercise that I can share also if 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 you're interested, something like that. But um, what we studied was a longer breathing protocol. It's like a 20 minute breathing protocol. It's called sky breath meditation that um, that we wanted to to look at because it had been found so effective after 9/11 in New York. Um, a lot of survivors had um, learned it, and it was very effective for anxiety and trauma. So if you don't have 20 minutes yep. and you're about to lead a team meeting or yep. you get bad news at work and you're in a leadership position or not, um, what can you lead us through a breathing exercise that has immediate efficacy? I can. Are you interested? I yeah. Am. Okay. <coughs> so let's go ahead and start by closing our eyes. And you can have your hands open on your lap, palms facing the ceiling. 
You'll notice that you can breathe more easily when your palms are open. And see if you can breathe through your nose. So, but before we change our breath, I just want you to check into the state of your mind right now. So just notice if you're, if each thought were a car, let's, uh, let's look and notice what the level of traffic is right now. If each thought were a car, is it, do you have a highway going on, a country road, or somewhere in between? And then once you've noticed where you're at, maybe also emotionally, noticing any feelings that are there. And then we'll go into the breathing exercise and see if anything shifts. So keeping your mouth closed, if you can, breathe through your nose. Breathe in for a count of one, two, three, four, hold. And breathe out through your nose, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Breathe in, two, three, four, through your nose again, eyes closed, hold. And breathe out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Breathe in, filling your lungs all the way to the top. Hold when they're full. And breathe out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Again, breathe in, eyes closed, fill your lungs. Hold at the top and breathe out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. A couple more, long deep breath in, two, three, four, hold. And breathe out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and breathe in, two, three, four, hold at the top, and breathe out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and relax the breath, keep your eyes closed, and just notice any shifts in the amount of thoughts in your mind and how you feel. When you're ready, you can open your eyes, notice any changes in how you feel and with your eyes open. How many of you notice a, a difference? Raise your hand just so I can see. Okay. What do you notice? Less busy. less busy. How many people feel less busy? Anything else? How many more calm? Okay. Is what happens in our bodies? I noticed you had us exhale for longer than yeah. we inhaled. What's yeah. going on with that? So remember I said that the blood pressure and heart rate are related to your inhale and exhale. So when you lengthen that exhale, you're starting to calm down the heart rate and blood pressure. So what we're used to is being, correct me if I'm wrong here, but our, we're kind of used to being in a stress mode, right? Fight or flight is sort <laughs> of the, the, it's, it's sort of the, no the trend these days. No one will correct you. are okay. not wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's what we're used to. Yeah. Um, and uh, what we're doing with the breathing is we're actually triggering the other side of the nervous system, which is called the parasympathetic nervous system, the calming response, which allows your body to restore itself, to repair itself, and it allows your mind to be calmer. And it's really interesting because we have this myth out there that you're supposed to be stressed to be productive. You know, you kind of just drink more coffee and get more done. But research shows that we're so much more innovative when our mind is peaceful. And in fact, if you think about when you get your most innovative ideas or like aha ideas. It's not when you're stressed out, it's when you're in the shower or taking a walk or when you're restful. Um, so being in a calmer place is allowing you to get more in touch with that inventive genius, but also to be so much more emotionally intelligent and present with other people and, and the list goes on, focused. I'm trying to stay calm because I'm up against that nasty clock, I but know. I <laughs> do want to ask for the purposes of, of the leaders in this room, it seems a given that people would want to enroll their teams and their colleagues in understanding how um, meaningful this, this simple kind of breath work is. But honestly, there may be a self-consciousness or an apologeticness about starting off, like, all right, I'm glad everyone's here today. I'm gonna be authentic. How are you all doing? Let's start a breathing exercise. Mm -hmm. I think so few work meetings begin that way. Mm -hmm. Do you have advice for how to sort of enroll our people yeah. in these breathing exercises in the workplace? Yeah. First of all, I do know leaders who do that. And they Wonderful. said it goes over really well. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it starts with you. 
I mean, as the leader, people are going to do what you do. If you have a mode of being stressed and anxious, that's what the team's going to yeah. be. But if, if, we, if we think about it, I think we've all worked for someone who's stressed and how that feels. It feels very unstable, right? And then maybe there's people in our lives who are like a rock. That's who we turn to as leaders, really, right? So it, it does start with self-work, right? It starts with doing, um, doing some of these practices yourself. And what you'll see is that people will come and ask you, what's going on with you? You're, you've got it together. That's the contagious part of the mm. positive energizing. It's calming for everybody. Yeah. And and maybe not feeling self-conscious or apologetic about starting some meetings by inviting people to close their eyes and, and breathe. Yeah. Why should you feel self-conscious about everyone being in a better state of well-being when you start a meeting? Isn't that where we want people to be? That's yeah. where they're going to be their best selves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it occurs to me, uh, just to wrap this up, I, I'm on a show called CBS Sunday Morning. And the executive producer, who probably stays up till 3 a.m. every into Sunday morning, every time, I don't know, some of you are probably familiar with the show, any time you have a story that aired that morning, you get an email from him. It's usually just one line, because there, there are probably 15 stories that air every morning, with something very specific that he appreciated in your piece. And, and in sort of, I, I always loved hearing from him, but until this moment, I didn't realize, like, that's some scientific leadership action so there. Good. That means I see you, I value your hard work, and he is taking time to make every single person on that team that week feel special. I love that you said that because as humans, after food and shelter, our number one priority is to feel, of course, safe. But after that, we all want to be seen, valued, heard, and appreciated. That's yeah. what every human being wants at every age of their life, right? Yeah. So when you do that in the workplace, it, it, it leads to results, not surprisingly. And that is an example, absolutely. It's an energizing. What he is doing is, is very energizing. And creates loyalty. And creates loyalty. Yeah. Forever. You have, you'll never forget it. Yeah. Right. Dr. Emma Seppala, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I, I think we are all breathing more deeply <laughs> and exhaling longer than we're inhaling. Um, and, and I wish for you that you'll take that to your workplace uh, into the holidays and beyond. Um, and I will invite everyone to move to the appell room for the next event. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you.